We're live. Yeah. All right. Great. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the number one <laughs> generative AI podcast in the world. Maybe in South Bay. Well, yeah, we're, we're working up to it, but yeah, we're, we're getting there. So yeah, everybody, welcome back to episode two. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about, um, all everything related to generative AI. We've got a, a episode with just uh, Shashank and I. Uh, in the future, we plan on getting more people, but uh, for now, you're stuck with us, uh, so you're going to get some of our opinions on stuff. So, uh, Shashank, what's in yeah. your what's on your mind? Um, I, I have a couple things on my mind, uh, but before that, you know, we uh, did uh, a bio uh, on me, so I kind of wanted to briefly talk about you, uh, my co-host, Mark Kuzmarski. Um, you want to tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and uh, why you got into AI and why you wanted to help me run a meetup and uh, what, what what do you do outside of uh, this meetup? Ah, all right, yeah. I wasn't expecting this, but sure. So I'm Mark Kuzmarski. I was originally born in, well, a suburb of Cleveland, Ohio. Going way back. Yeah, you know, <laughs> at first I was, I was born. <laughs> Uh, to, to two parents. Uh, anyways, yep. we'll, we'll, we'll skip all that. Yada uh-huh. yada. I got a computer science degree. Nice. Um, and then, uh, and then I ended up uh, moving to California after uh, college. Actually, it's a somewhat funny story. I remember I originally accepted a job in Denver, Colorado. Oh. Uh, I actually really wanted to uh, live in Denver, uh, go skiing. I, I had an internship there over the summer and I, I fell in love with the place uh, loved all the outdoor sports and then I think I was like on my way uh, to orientation because the orientation was in the Bay Area and they're like um, yeah Mark first thing first thing we're gonna increase your salary uh, two thousand dollars so nice. that was that was exciting uh, but then I didn't realize that um, the Bay Area is Probably like you need double two, double two the price or, or something <laughs> of uh, Colorado. So um, you know, I didn't know. And then so we're gonna we're gonna double we're gonna not double your salary. We're gonna raise your salary two thousand dollars. And then, uh, but you are now gonna be uh, in California. You're gonna be in the Bay Area. And I had no idea like where that was. Uh, I I don't I don't even know if I've been to California. Actually, no, I've been to California, but I didn't really do much. Um, you know. Uh, I just, I think, went on like a little trip or something when I was uh, a student. And then after that, I moved to uh, California, um, worked uh, doing some uh, biomedical uh, consulting uh, there. Um, quit my job after like two years. Um, after that, in 2017, I moved to Japan for uh, like three years, uh, three and a half years. Um, worked at some startups there. I was working on like a web app, uh, and then also I did uh, some cryptocurrency development. Uh, then in 2020, uh, after COVID hit, I um, moved back uh, to the Bay Area. Um, so I've been living in California now for a total of I think let's see 2024 now. So I think what it's almost seven years yeah. I've been living in. Uh, this area, so the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, whatever you want to call it, I've lived um, here. I, uh, I still feel like you just got here, but uh, seven years is a long time. Yeah, yeah. It, it you know it feels like I just got here. Uh, it feels like I just moved in yesterday, but yeah, it's it's been a while. Um, and you've been at uh, Amazon for the last few years. Yeah, that's right. I've been working at Amazon for a little over three years now. Uh, I'm doing uh, Android development there, so. Um, working on uh, specifically the Fire tablets, uh, so it's it's been it's been a good good three and a half years or whatever I've been at Amazon. Uh, no complaints. Awesome company. Um, Do you get to it. work on any AI stuff uh, at your job? Uh, not a lot. Um, a lot of that is handled by a different team. I mostly do OS development, uh, so mostly like Android stuff. Um, I touch Alexa a little bit, uh, although um, I don't really get to touch a lot of the AI part, more just kind of build some of the front ends and whatnot. But uh, yeah, unfortunately not a ton of AI stuff that I get to work on, but you could call me more of a, an AI enthusiast. Uh, so I play a lot of it in my free time, but yeah, at work I don't do a lot of uh, AI development. Nice. Um, 
So speaking of uh, side projects and uh, tinkering and uh, being an enthusiast, how do you like uh, keep up with this space? Like there's there's so much noise and there's always something new every week. Um, I, I, I think the whole world kind of uh, was shook when ChatGPT first came out and that was the big development. Uh, but since then, there's something like uh, every new company working on foundational models, uh, not to mention fine-tuned models uh, in different uh, verticals, different domains. Um, yeah, how, how do you uh, how do you handle all that? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I think I'm missing a lot of things, honestly. But uh, there's a few uh, sources that I really like. Um, Honestly, I'd say the, the number one source right now that I get my information from is our meetup. That's um, true. <laughs> yeah, uh, where people will come to me and say like, "Hey, Mark, like, check out this cool thing." I love that. Um, and uh, I really like that. Um, like, I think that there aren't too many uh, events, like in the world, really, where people are just gonna like t- show you all the cool stuff that they're working on. So I think that is the number one kind of filter for me uh if somebody comes to me in person and shows me i'm gonna definitely take a look um but there's a few other things that i really like um one is uh i'm on hacker news just constantly um yeah you're looking at the different uh ai models that are released uh different blogs showing how to you know do tips and tricks fine tune uh look at uh, people's opinions on different articles but yeah i'm love love hacker news and see you know what made it to the front page another it's, uh, thing it's, that, it's kind of funny that yeah. sam altman used to run hacker uh y combinator and now he's working on open ai yeah, yeah you know full circle that's true that's true uh what were you gonna say oh yeah uh, i was gonna say another um thing that i like a lot is um the tech meme ride home i think that's a oh, really okay. good uh, podcast that I listen to. It's just like a daily podcast. Um, I think it's like around you know 15 minutes or so mm-hmm. where they'll just talk about the tech news. It's more than just AI. It's kind of just all tech news, but I really uh, like that one a lot. They kind of condense it down for you and they always are going to talk about something interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, talk about, you know, maybe for like a minute or two for each story and just keep going through all the stories and uh, you can always get like the daily uh, stuff there. I like that one quite a bit. Um, for longer form concept content, I really like uh, like the Twit Network. Um, they're going to mm-hmm. talk a lot about. They have a bunch of shows. They have I think they have one called like This Week in Tech, This Week in yeah. Google. Um, I don't oh, This Week in Google. I didn't know that. Yeah, they have This Week in Google. I think uh, like This Week in Microsoft or something. Okay. Or maybe they have a bunch of stuff. Um, yeah, they call it Twig. I'm a big fan of that one. Yeah, they they were founded in uh, 2005. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I remember uh, listening to them. Leo Laporte. Yeah. Uh, this Week in Tech. Yeah. Uh, way back when. And he used to talk about like uh, uh, before Twitter came out and uh, he was like one of the first users on Twitter and talking about, oh, this, you know, social uh, networking platform and I don't fully get it, but like I'm kind of addicted to it. And, <laughs> you know, early days. And uh, uh, speaking of uh, Twit, um, I, I started following uh, Jason Calacanis. Um, and he has Twist. I think oh. it's like a, like a play on uh, Twit, the original tech podcast. Um, he has a take on the AI space and uh, from like a more investor standpoint, where he talks about startups, uh, different funding rounds, the challenges that uh, founders face. Um, I really like that because uh, for the last few weeks, all the conversations have been about AI. Um, about government policies affecting AI, about uh, how different investors are looking at AI companies, um, what kind of spaces you can tackle, where are the opportunities, uh, what problems founders are facing, and um, I, I I really like that one. You know, we should put all of these in the description. So yeah. for people listening to the podcast, uh, if you want to get the uh, stuff that we used for the news yeah. uh we'll we'll post it in the uh the podcast uh, description so uh, i'll make a list that. yeah and uh, if you guys have any sources for us we'd be happy to hear them yeah um and speaking of the jason calacanis twist uh one he also had like a newsletter inside business it's not uh, directly related to startups but it's more like a macroeconomic overview of what's happening um it talks about large companies big developments um government policies and things like that and 
that's uh, that's kind of helpful to to get an overview um, of the space. Yeah. And then one other thing that I've been playing around with uh, for getting news is I've actually been trying to create an AI program to help me summarize the news. So right now it only will uh, summarize hacker news articles. So uh, I built a program that will scrape uh, the content on Hacker News. So for those that don't know, uh, Hacker News is a website, kind of like Reddit, I guess, um, where people will just post articles. And um, the articles tend to be pretty tech slash business slash startup focused. Um, and then the top ones will uh, be voted up and ranked to the top. Uh, so then the number one articles will be on the front page. I think there's maybe 20... 5, 30 articles that are on the front page and uh, people will uh, leave comments on the articles and uh, just link to them and just talk about it. So I built a, a web uh, a scraper tool that will scrape Hacker News uh, once per day uh, and then it'll ask the AI. So I've been playing around with a couple models uh, for uh, you know which AI I'm using, but I'll have I have one from I, I've been trying GPT-4. I've been also trying a uh, Mistral. Uh, mm -hmm. So Mistral, if you uh, is a really cool open source competitor to uh, OpenAI. Does uh, that uh, run locally? It, you can, okay. you can. Uh, but I've been using their API. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a lot cheaper than uh, GPT-4. Uh, but you have to get a uh, invite uh, to use it. Although mm -hmm. when I applied, I got approved in like two days or something like that. Okay. So I think that they're churning through people pretty quickly. And uh, it seems pretty good. Uh, and does that have a web scraping ability too? Um, no, I scraped it in, um, I used some uh, Python libraries to, oh. uh, to pull the articles. I'm just using like basic, you know, mm. regular uh, web 1.0, web 2.0 scraping. What? Come on, you didn't want to use an agent? I didn't. <laughs> I just well, actually, you know, to be fair, I used GPT four to okay. to write the code to do the scraping. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there you go. So uh, there we go. Anyways, uh, so I scraped it and then I pulled each of the articles and then I asked the AI, um, "Is this article based off of the title mm -hmm. uh, newsworthy?" Um, and I oh. and then um, I said, "If it is newsworthy." summarize it and then uh take all the summaries convert that to a tra podcast transcript mm -hmm. so it'll so summary it'll take all the articles uh filter them down based mm -hmm. on what it thinks is newsworthy um what's its uh, uh acceptance rate for newsworthy articles uh, you know it's pretty high okay so it, it's uh it needs some fine tuning okay. uh I'm, I'm working on the actual article selection because some of them are a little uh, interesting let's okay. say what it what it'll pick um anyways it'll it'll take all that convert it to a podcast transcript uh, i found that gpt4 is much better at creating a podcast tra transcript than mistral okay. um so for example if i had 10 articles that i wanted to summarize um uh, mistral would maybe get like four that'll actually summarize whereas gpt4 will get like all all 10 and actually make like a legitimate podcast transcript from them so then i'll have this transcript hmm. which is text and then i will Upload that text to Eleven Labs. Uh, so mm -hmm. Eleven Labs is a really cool tool that you can convert text to audio. Um, so it'll make a, an MP3 file, I think, um, or some sort of audio uh, file. I don't remember the exact format, but um, then it will speak it supernaturally. And then I'll take that audio file and then I'll upload it to Podbean and then have a daily tech news podcast summarizing hacker news nice. so yeah i'll uh, uh i'm curious have you tried uh open ai's text-to-speech because the demo from uh their presentation was insanely good no i haven't uh, let me let me play a let me play a demo i'm not sure if this is the latest one that they demoed but let's have a listen the sun rises in the east and sets in the west this simple fact has been observed by humans for thousands of years I mean, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Do they have different uh, voices? They do. In the heart of the city, there is a large park where people go to relax and enjoy nature. And oh, does does a different one? The train chugged along the tracks, carrying passengers to their destinations. That's like an audiobook uh, voice. I mean, that's pretty good. Yeah, I'll I'll let you listen to this one uh, okay. that I that I have. So here's today, uh, January eighteenth. I think it's the eighteenth. Yeah. 
Oh wait, actually I have it at double speed. Let me let me slow it down real quick. Uh, I was listening to my podcast a little fast. Same. Hello and welcome to Tech Flash, the AI powered podcast with all your latest tech news. It's pretty Whisper good. Speech, a new open source project developed so. by Collabora. Anyways, nice. yeah, it's I don't know, it's not bad. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Eleven Labs is is pretty good. Um, but yeah, it'll do that. I'm I'm still working on the content selection. Um, mm-hmm. but I want to. Uh, compile more articles so and from different sources so if you have any ideas of like how i can get the interesting articles yeah interesting articles um that seems like a subjective criteria um maybe you could uh compare different llms and see which uh whose selection process that you most like and then just pick that one um because i feel like uh, every llm has some kind of a bias and uh, you're just trying to figure out whose bias you're, uh, you have an affinity towards. That's true. Yeah, or maybe I could like change some of the prompt uh, prompting because I found that something that I don't really want is a lot of I'll get a lot of um, like personal blogs where uh, it'll talk about it where it's like somebody will say like oh like you know Python two versus Python three or something like that, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I don't really want that kind of thing, but it'll summarize uh, some of these like esoteric programming uh, blog posts. What, what do you think is newsworthy, if you had to pick? Well, I think a couple things. One is I want to know what the big companies are doing. Um, so for example, like if Google or a- Apple or uh, Amazon or something released a new product i think that would be pretty newsworthy if it you know pertained actually it doesn't need to pertain to ai it could just be anything like that uh also if there was maybe some sort of uh like breakthrough in uh technology maybe somebody figured out cold fusion or yeah. something like that right i'd want to i'd want to know so big breakthroughs in science technology yeah. um major releases from large uh, corporations or a startup too uh, startups, okay. I think that'd be okay as well right if they had like a new product but like what I don't care about is like you know an API update in rust right like I don't think like rust async is interesting mm-hmm. actually it is interesting let me take that back but <laughs> but, but but I think that um, the average person wouldn't understand it. Yeah, it's too specific. Yeah, so I want it to be something that I could, you know, tell any person off the street and they would understand. Not something like super, super specific to some, you know, programming language. Like if Postgres uh, released a new feature, I don't care. You want a pop news for the lowest common denominator of a person? Uh, a little bit, a little bit more <laughs> than that, but. Specific for tech, but uh, yeah, tech, yeah, somewhat, a little bit. Um, yeah, you should uh, try playing around with the, um, like the prompt, to yeah. see if you can codify uh, these preferences that you have. I feel like it can do a pretty good job. I think that's a that's a good idea. Um, cool. So, anyways, yeah, that's a long and windy way of uh, how I get the news. Um, anyways, Shashank, you were also mentioning that you saw. Uh, this like new GPT store. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, can you tell me about? I don't. I think I maybe played with it, but I don't really know much about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they announced this a while back. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, a demo day, they said they were gonna allow. Creator- What's a demo day? Um, this was I think uh, two months ago, where they announced a bunch of new technologies. Uh, one of them was the text to speech. Um, API that I mentioned, uh, it sounded really good in the demo. Uh, they talked about the vision for their company um, and where they're kind of headed. And uh, it was it was very general, um, but the big news was the GPT store, where they're going to allow people to build custom versions of ChatGPT by adding a prompt, um, a document um, to use as a knowledge base, and hook it up to any kind of API that they want using a thing called the, the something they call actions. Um, I think it's gonna be amazing. Um, this is what blew up the iPhone when they opened up uh, their software to third-party developers, built a marketplace, and allowed uh, everyone else to build really cool stuff on top of their product. 
Um, and I think they're getting there. Uh, they're building um, a searchable app store where you can find uh, featured products, uh, trending um, GPTs in different categories. So we were talking about this one earlier, uh, the All Trails um, uh, GPT, which suggests uh, trails uh, to hike in different places. That's pretty cool. Uh, so I could say like, oh, I'm going camping in Yosemite this weekend. Like what trails do you recommend? And also yeah. I'm like super out of shape and I want to just uh-huh. <laughs> like, uh, you know, do like a, a short trail. I think you could. You could give it uh, the location. You could give it uh, preferences and it'll spit out a suggestion rather than having you having to manually type in all that in the app. That's pretty cool. Um, and uh, you you actually mentioned you did use this without even knowing. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I, I didn't even realize it was a GPT. I, I saw that there was one, I don't remember the name of it, but it allows you to search medical documents. So I remember I just started putting in random symptoms from diseases. And uh, the, actually, I think I remember I asked it for the pros and cons of vitamin D. And it had a lot what, of... What was it called? Do you remember? Uh, man, I don't remember. I'll um, take a look. Yeah. Consensus. Oh, consensus. Yeah. yeah. I think that's it. Search 200 million academic papers from consensus. That's it. That's it. I feel like this here is just going to um, make uh, scientific research so much easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, because finding like sorting through all these papers is a lot of effort and like no one person can read everything yeah sorting isn't too bad uh we had a google scholar where you can just search for research papers um uh, well the ones that don't need a license and uh, i'm not sure how these uh people handle licensing because maybe they don't (laughs) don't. yeah i don't know yeah well, we'll see how the uh, New York Times uh, lawsuit plays out. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, what do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we can, we can uh, touch on that later. But uh, okay. yeah, I think uh, the marketplace, the GPT store is super interesting. What I'm excited for is when they open it up to have some kind of an authentication feature. Because right now, you're just getting general information. Everyone is accessing the same version of consensus or all trails. You can't... Uh, hook it up to your uh, Gmail, for example, or your Google Docs and have it get your context. Like, I, I can't even uh, give it a to-do list. Uh, it doesn't know anything about me, apart from, like, the um, custom instructions that you put in, which is, like, a couple hundred lines. Um, once you get authentication, I feel like that'll open it up to uh, um, long-term sustainable businesses that can offer value to customers. Oh, that's true. Personalized. Yeah. Like, hypothetically, if they had some sort of profile about you, they could know your likes and preferences. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I could say like, hey, order me my uh, usual at my favorite restaurant and uh, maybe it'll mm. get you the pineapple and pepperoni pizza at Domino's and have it delivered. Or it could tell tell you, oh, maybe you've been having that a lot. Maybe try, try, to, <laughs> try to have a salad. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, it, it could know your. Uh, you, it could hook up with all your smart devices. Yeah, that'd potentially, be really cool. right? Like you know the smart trackers. Um, it could. Yeah, actually, I think that would work really good if it like hooked up maybe with your Apple Watch mm-hmm. or uh, your Fitbit, whatever. Um, looked at your heart rate. Uh, looked at the exercise details. Maybe mm-hmm. you could even. Uh, hook up to your calendar and see how often you went to the gym <laughs> and uh, tell you to maybe work out a little little harder, a little more. Hook it up to your uh, Strava app and use it as like a workout coach. Yeah, yeah, it could. I think there's a lot of stuff that you could do. Yeah, so you get your regular. I don't know. Anyways, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's exciting. We live in amazing times. I feel like this is the thing that's so exciting is today is the worst this technology will ever be. <laughs> It's only up from here. Um, well, there's uh, doomsday scenarios that a lot of people are concerned about, but you know, uh, you it, know. It, the, the, the technology will get more capable. Um, uh, another thing that I was uh, curious about is uh, their pricing model. So they haven't announced it. Um, no one knows uh, how they're gonna um, uh, like compensate developers for uh, all these custom GPTs. And uh, when you look at the other app stores, um, 
the Play Store, the iOS App Store, they have a, what is it, like a 70-30 split where uh, creators get most of the revenue because the uh, traditional mobile app stores don't do that much work. They, they give you a platform, uh, you know, which is uh, highly valuable, um, but the developer puts in most of the effort. Right. Here, um, it costs a lot of money to run the LLM. That's true. And, that is true. Uh, right now, you're not paying for any specific GPT. Um, I wonder if that'll change. But uh, right now, the GPTs are, are available to you as part of the uh, ChatGPT Pro subscription. So I feel like um, it's going to be tricky. I wonder, uh, I wonder if it'll even be worthwhile to build like a GPT. You know, that's a good point because... Right now, I'm sure. I, oh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I would be willing to bet that OpenAI might be losing uh, some money on Think running. So? Uh, maybe hmm. on all these GPTs. Uh, I'm sure that uh, allowing the training and the inference uh, for all the users might be very expensive. I, I don't know how many people subscribe to uh, OpenAI. Um, well, they do limit your usage per hour. So, what do you think? Do you think they're Do you think they're making money on this? I think they're making money on the inference. I don't think they're losing money on the inference. Um, whether or not they're uh, cash flow positive, that I have no idea. Is okay. It training. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's a different question. Yeah. All right. That's fair. So, I mean, to me, it's not clear if it's like super profitable just because you're not paying for how much you're using each of these uh, models, I assume, right? If you're. Uh, if you have Unless you're a developer and you're using their API. That's true. That is true. You do have to pay for the API. Not to mention like uh, bigger enterprise deals that they have, which is also something they uh, demoed at the, or they talked about briefly in their demo day. That's true. But I don't know, because I guess if you have the App Store, which is a 70-30 split, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. but here OpenAI is doing the majority of the work, I would assume, yeah. where... Um, so maybe they'll do like like a fifty fifty split, or I can see them um, changing the pricing model to buy subscriptions to specific uh, GPTs. Well, they could, or maybe it'll be like YouTube because doesn't YouTube do like a, I don't think oh, they yeah. publish that, but maybe it's like a fifty fifty because I think like mm. you know YouTube is extremely uh, expensive uh, for how much it costs to host all the videos. I think um, so. I think so, yeah. Because okay. uh, you know, you got you have to probably see. an order of magnitude lower than running LLMs, though. May maybe I'm not sure because okay. the you have to duplicate. I assume the videos mm -hmm. under uh, for a lot of different um, locales, right? So you're, you're probably have like I'm assuming Google has server farms like all over the world that are duplicating the videos. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be like available for everybody who's watching, yep. um, and I'm sure that is probably a semi-easy problem for popular videos um, because a popular video, they only need to watch or upload once and have lots of viewers. But mm. for all of the long smaller tail. YouTube channels and all the long tail I'm, that you know have like 12 views, uh, they still have to host that. And uh, that might be mm. um, expensive for all the availability. So I'm thinking that like for the long tail, YouTube has like a, a much more uh, difficult problem than where what OpenAI has where they're just running the exact same model mm -hmm. for all users mm -hmm. um so i That's don't know point. uh and i think youtube does like a 50 50 split something like that for the okay. more con popular content creators what does that mean 50 50 50 of what the the advertising revenue Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I was thinking about their uh, YouTube Premium subscription. I'm not. No, sure I don't think so. I, I think like for that is. I think they pay you based off of like how valuable your video is. So like, if you are a, um, I think like I read it somewhere that if you are talking about something where advertisers really want to pay a lot of money for, I think the number one thing, if I remember correctly, was like mesothelioma, mesothelioma, because a lot of those. Uh, lawyers uh make a bunch of money uh, i don't know suing somebody people who have mesothelioma uh whatever and then i think one of the lowest paid ones is like music uh, or comedy something like that mm -hmm. because nobody's really willing to buy um uh mm -hmm. so and then everything in between where like you know if you're talking about you know the hottest stock picks you'll get paid uh, a little bit higher yeah, so this uh, website also does say that uh, it splits its YouTube Premium membership 
where Google gets 45 and creators get 55% of that. Oh, which okay. Which is, I assume, split out, uh, among all the channels that uh, people watch. But only the big channels. Uh, the big er channels. Because I think you need yeah. to have like a thousand subscribers or something like that. There's some minimum start, threshold. Yeah, yeah. Getting, getting paid. So... I don't know. I assume that OpenAI will probably do something similar to that uh, because I think it's a similar-ish problem. Yeah, there's an existing precedent for that. But the cost of running these LLMs, oof. Um, Oh, actually, uh, that's another thing they mentioned at uh, Demo Day. The GPT-4 Turbo is actually cheaper than GPT-4, which is kind of confusing. I'm not sure why they still offer GPT-4. Isn't GPT-4 Turbo better than GPT-4? Better and cheaper. Huh. Yeah. Actually, for my podcast, I was using GPT-4. Maybe that's why it was so expensive. <laughs> I, I should change that. How, how much did it cost to generate one episode? Um, I think... Uh, so on Mistral, uh, when I was using that, it cost less than a penny. Um, so I don't know. Uh, very low. Um, I think for GPT-4, it cost maybe five cents hmm. uh, or something per episode. So not, not too bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was under under a dime, under ten cents. So I, I haven't even paid a dollar yet. So yeah, not not too bad. Yeah, I'm excited to see more um, cheaper open source models that uh, we can run locally. Um, yeah, have you? Uh, I, I've I've tried the. Um, so recently, I got access to Gemini Ultra with the uh, Bard Advanced. They're calling it. Oh, nice! Um, and it's it's better. Um, but it performs differently than uh, ChatGPT. Um, in what ways? Uh, uh, I'm not sure how much I should uh, talk about. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, let's. It's it's still in uh, private beta. Uh, oh, okay. But uh, you know, it's it's better at some things. Uh, it's different at other things. Um, one cool UI feature that I like is you can highlight a section of the text, uh, the response from the LM, and ask it to just modify that section. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. It's easy, uh, you know, you highlight, click edit, and then boom, you have a new version of that chunk. Oh. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. I suppose you could do that manually, but, you know, having these uh It's like a quality of life. Features. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a little bit better. I mean, I'm sure everybody else could probably do it, but, yeah. you know, uh, they don't do yeah. it yet. Um, yeah, that's they, pretty cool. They do need an app, though. Uh, I think it would be way easier with the, a mobile app. Yeah, I use the the ChatGPT app all the time, yeah. and um, Perplexity. I use that one quite oh, yeah? a bit too. Yeah, for research. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. it's pretty good. Uh, I like it because it will always return the source articles, mm-hmm. uh, which is which is pretty nice. Um, running AI the LLMs locally. Um, you know, I have a MacBook Air. Yeah. And uh, it can run some super quantized models. Yeah. So like. Uh, I don't know. How would you describe quantization? Um, without getting too technical, you take um, the neural network that uh, runs the LLM and then you shrink it by removing things that aren't as important um, and representing the more complex architecture uh, in a smaller way that is pretty close uh, and contains most of that information. Yeah. That's my understanding. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, so I used some super quantized models. Yeah. Uh, so I tried like a um, uh, an alpaca model. Mm-hmm. Um, so alpaca is a model that's based on the uh, llama, llama or llama 2 model from mm-hmm. Facebook. I think it was made by Stanford, if I remember correctly. That's right. Um, and uh, it's, my understanding is just like a super quantized mm-hmm. uh, llama 2. So I, I oh, ran, it's even more quantized than llama. I think so. Oh. I think so. Uh, I, I might be missing some details there, but I think it was uh, originally trained on Llama and then quantized down uh, to make it run on uh, like all hardware. So I got that running on my MacBook Air, and it's pretty good for what it is. Um, I mean, it's, it's great to run on a MacBook Air. It has like you know some knowledge, but uh, it, it's nowhere near as good as something like ChatGPT. Um, so it's way worse uh, than that, but it's great for you know what it is. Um, mm-hmm. But I don't know. I'm always connected to the internet, so I'm just and I subscribe to ChatGPT. I subscribe yeah. to Mistral. I subscribe to all these things. So it's like nice. you know, if I can, like I'm going to use the best one, right? Yeah. Like I mean, this one's okay. 
But. For one-off use cases, I think it makes sense to use the best one. But if you're building something that has a lot of repeated calls to an LLM um, for a specialized use case, I feel like you can uh, optimize that. For sure, for sure. Yeah, because I heard that it's better to find, like a lot of these smaller models are better for fine tuning uh, because if you have a very specific small uh, use case, let's say like, I don't know, I can't even think of a thing that you'd want to fine tune. Maybe like, looking at uh, the sentiment of uh, like product reviews or something like that. Okay. You, you could probably fine tune a model uh, that was small uh, to do that particular task uh, mm. really well. Um, like if it's like a one singular task that you want to do, I think you could fine tune it. So for example, I could give uh, maybe I could label some Amazon product data and look for uh, the user sentiment, maybe like, oh, I was happy or I'm sad or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, give uh, some label to that data and maybe you could use an LLM for that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so the intuition behind that, I think, is uh, if you have a s narrow specific use case, you don't need the large models with all its uh, worldly knowledge as much, which is a lot more expensive. And I think uh, the smaller the model, the less data you need to replace its existing knowledge to change its behavior uh, in a certain way. So I think like smaller models perform uh, well with smaller training data sets, whereas larger models for a similar use case need a lot more training data because like they just have a lot more existing knowledge um, that they're kind of uh, biased towards. So you just need a lot more training data. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because I mean, if it's a really narrow use case, like you don't need to know the whole world history, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, speaking of narrow use cases in Alpaca, uh, I was reading that uh, Google and MIT released like a health alpaca um, for like health predictions, and apparently it's very good and outperforms other models, bigger models at like health predictions. Really? Uh, you should uh, you should check that out. Wow. Because uh, Mark here is like a health enthusiast <laughs> loves tracking everything he can about himself um and uh trying to keep up with the latest developments in longevity uh optimizing your health sleep nutrition fitness um anything else you can think of Th that's true uh, i go a little overboard sometimes so check check out a uh, health llm i'm not sure if it's uh, public uh, you know alpaca is always um stanford and research based but yeah check it out yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, if we find a link to that, we'll we'll post that in the show notes. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I, I got this from uh, another weekly newsletter, um, the AI Roundup. Uh, it's a Substack called uh, AI Tidbits Substack, and uh, it's pretty good. It gives a, an overview of the new developments. Um, like you mentioned, um, it has a good selection criteria for what is newsworthy. It picks um, releases from big companies. Um, Google, DeepMind, Stanford, MIT, um, and also new models and new types of models. So like a different modal or multimodal or something that does uh, 3D models. Um, do you want to define what a multimodal model? Actually, yeah. we've been talking a lot about models. I'm assuming almost everybody here who is listening knows what a model is. I would assume so, yeah. Yeah, okay. But uh, maybe they don't know the term multimodal model. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, it's the domain that this LLM operates in. So most of these uh, popular models that you've probably uh, used or are familiar with, ChatGPT, uh, Google's Bard and whatnot, um, they're text-based models, or at least they used to be. Um, and then you used to have like uh, Midjourney, Dolly, uh, Stable Diffusion, which were image models. Um, and now you have models that can understand, generate, and interpret both text, image, and some of these can understand uh, and interact with videos too. Um, so it's doing things across multiple modalities, uh, text, image, uh, video, um, and even audio. So yeah, these multimodal uh, model, uh, LLMs, I guess. Um, Man, that feels like all of them. Like uh, now, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, or I mean, just like if you think about the human senses, like I can see with my eyes, I smell? can, yes, yeah, smell, maybe smell, touch. Yeah. 
that's that's one. Yeah. Um, but like I can see with my eyes. I can t- taste. Taste. That's another one. Um, well, I, I mean, you can get fine uh, grain. You can do like three uh, D models. That's so kind of like a visual, but um, to output a three D file. Um, I mean, it could be text, but you know, um, if you break down. Um, individual domains into specific verticals like coding. Uh, would you consider that a separate modality, or is that same as text? I think that would be the same as text, right? If you're, because I mean, code is just text that you run. Um, although so, it is like a specific use case of text, but I would consider that modality is just text. What do you think about a three D model? If it's broken down into like a file which contains, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm actually, I've never played around with the 3D model, so uh, I'm not sure what it contains, but um, I have used a 3D printer where it contains slices of the 3D space. So it's kind of like a bunch of images almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like a bunch of images. A bunch of 2D images sliced of different uh, widths. In a certain sense, that's what a video is too, right? Where it's just a, like, you know, a bunch of images. Sequence of images? Yeah, sequence of images all put together. So would you consider that a different model? Video, yeah, I think so, and I think I would it's also different enough. From yeah, I, images and uh, 3D models, I would also consider that too because or different as well because you know you're dealing with another not domain but dimension in this case, mm. um, and I think that you know things being 3D um, would be in my mind a big enough of a, a difference compared to a actual like image, mm-hmm. even though they're I'm I'm sure probably some of the algorithms are going to be related for what they'll use like between like images and and text and 3d models but to me it seems like they're going to be different enough i mean i i don't know if you there's a limit on the number of modalities i feel like you can represent data uh in a lot of different ways um and just because it's a 2d image um i don't know if that's the same as uh, let's say an x-ray for example um would you consider uh medical LLMs that can interpret x-ray CT scans as image models? Yeah, I think so. You think so? Well, because I think at the end of the day, if you have an x-ray, you're not interpreting the x-ray directly, right? Because if you think about a human, right? Like, uh, an x-ray is going to happen. It's going to generate a image, and then a doctor is going to look at that image and interpret it. So okay. in this case, I think you had an x-ray, um, you wouldn't feed the x-ray directly into the model. You convert the x-ray of your, you know, broken bone to an image and then, you, uh, you know, feed that image into the model and then ask it like, hey, like, what's wrong? Um, what about uh, sound? Audio waves. Oh, that's definitely a different, moment. different modality. Different For okay. sure. Yeah, I think so. Um, unless you converted that sound to like text but not all sound like can be directly converted to text Mm -hmm. so for example um if i had an alarm clock how would i do that i mean should we have like some onomatopoeia uh which will say like you know like ring ring or like splat or something like that Mm -hmm. which kind of but like you know how you can do a bird sound or like you know somebody playing Mm -hmm. the trumpet like you can't convert that to text maybe you can convert it to musical notes i guess but it's not the same i feel like you know something's lost there um, speaking of things that could be represented as text, uh, I think uh, I was reading uh, researchers were trying to represent uh, DNA as uh, a sequence of strings, which which is... I mean, know, it is, it, right? I don't know what it is, uh, well, I mean, but you could represent it that sure, way. Sure, yeah. Um, and it was... It, I forget what the use case was. Um, um, so I guess if you break down um, a new concept into some other form you could uh basically generate everything with like a few modalities text audio image and video oh that is a notification for our gen ai meetup should Ah, we uh, wrap this up mark yeah i think we should (laughs) i think we should uh we gotta we gotta head out soon um anyways uh thanks everybody for listening to us talk um i'm glad you're able to uh join us uh for the number one generative (laughs) ai podcast in the world well someday (laughs) Eh, you know we'll get there uh 
Anyways, uh, I hope to see you again. I will see you next week uh, or next time. Uh, we're not, we haven't figured out the exact schedule yet, but uh, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Peace. <laughs>